so today we've been really uh, just sitting in and wrestling with this. The, the, the focus of our day is that Jesus is the ultimate authority. And just to, to bring you back at the, from the, the beginning and when we woke up, we found ourselves here in this place and we walked through the passage in Luke. Um, Dan uh, unpacked um, uh, the, some realities of who Jesus is and then we had the reenactment of the calming of the storm. Callum then got up here and unpacked um, even further um, what the disciples' response was and we then looked at the storms of our life. Uh, time we ushered in this whole concept of thinking about who do we or what do we or where do we turn to when the storms of life hit. We came back here and Andrew shared about the reality of Jesus' power. Extraordinary. Like I'm still trying to get my head around this concept that he spoke and the wind and the waves obeyed. They were still. And that's remarkable. Uh, Callum then walked us through what faith is and then um, we unpacked further that Jesus does calm the storms in our life, but sometimes the storms remain raging. But even in those moments, Jesus gives us the peace, just the, the, that shalom peace that we spoke about, that we can replicate what Jesus did in the boat and we can have that peace that actually we are able to rest and be still, even though the monster storm is raging around us. I hope you have enjoyed your day as you as we've walked through this whole idea of Jesus as the ultimate authority. And those of you who are new to Teen Street, we um, meet in this space every night for what we call throne room. And it's essentially it's just a space that we set aside across our week that we're able to respond to everything that Jesus, that Jesus is downloading into our hearts in regards to the content that we're walking through. And we just pray that in this space, as you engage in the experiences here, that you just be free to do so. And it has been warming my heart to see that there are already those amongst you who are free enough to do that and, and just come as you are to the ultimate king. And as I said, it warms my heart. Um, so one of the things that I love doing um, is sinking my teeth into the Bible. In the last few years, I've had the incredible opportunity to go to college and study it. And my heart has just been exploding with what God shows me when I delve into his word. And one of the characters that we find in, in our Bible that always just, I just reckon, uh, I look forward to the day of just hanging out with him in heaven and just hearing from him what his life was like and just spending time just chewing the fat. I don't know if they have fat in heaven, but it's an expression. And that person that I look forward to um, hanging out with is the gentleman that we know as Joseph. And um, I'm just going to share with you the story of Joseph. And the best, in my opinion, and you may agree with me in this, is that sometimes the best way to share a story is to share it with Lego because everything is awesome with Lego. There it is. Okay, so when we pick up the story of Joseph in the Bible, he is 17 years old and he spends most of his days tending to his father, Jacob's livestock. Joseph is the second youngest of 12 boys and the much-loved of his father. 
To show his special love for Joseph, Jacob made him a coat of many colours. Seeing the extent of the fatherly love shown to Joseph by Jacob, the other sons grew increasingly jealous of Joseph and began to plot against him. At the next opportunity, the brothers ganged up on Joseph and stripped him of his precious coat and then threw him in a well. The brothers conspired as the brothers conspired a story that Joseph was killed by a wild animal and upon hearing this news Jacob his father was full of sadness no longer a thought in his brothers minds Joseph ended up being rescued out of the well however Joseph's freedom was short lived as the Midianites only rescued Joseph with the intention of selling him as a slave. Joseph was quickly sold into slavery and found himself bound for Egypt. Joseph was sold to Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officials and the captain of the guard, to run his household, but he soon found himself the desire of Potiphar's wife. who continued to pursue him. However, Joseph, a man of integrity, continued to deny her. This led to Joseph being falsely accused and thrown into jail. While in jail, Joseph encountered the royal cupbearer and baker, <laughs> who had been thrown into jail after upsetting Pharaoh. Both the cupbearer and baker were having dreams that plagued them with turmoil during the night. And when Joseph inquired to their sad state, they expressed their need for someone to interpret their dreams. Upon hearing the account of their dreams, Joseph managed to interpret them, firstly telling the cupbearer that Pharaoh would indeed reinstate him to the position in his palace. However, the interpretation of the baker's dream told that his fate was death. Upon his release, as per the interpretation, Joseph asked the cupbearer to not forget him. However, Joseph was soon forgotten. Meanwhile, in Egypt, Pharaoh too was having dreams that troubled him greatly. So he called for all the magicians and wise men of the land to interpret his puzzling dreams. However, none of them were able to give Pharaoh the answers that he sought. The cupbearer, who was helped by Joseph some time past, remembered the interpretation that his Hebrew cellmate gave him and mentioned to Pharaoh of Joseph's abilities. Joseph was released from jail and summoned before Pharaoh. Pharaoh told Joseph of his troubled dreams and asked him if he could interpret them, to which Joseph answered, I cannot do it, but God will give Pharaoh the answers he desires. The interpretation God gave Pharaoh through Joseph was accurate and true, and seeing Joseph to be the good and honourable man he was, Pharaoh made Joseph governor of the land of Egypt. A famine has hit the land of Egypt and its neighbouring countries at this time, and people and livestock were suffering. Jacob, Joseph's father, seeing the desperate need amongst his family for food and supplies, had heard that the governor of Egypt had planned ahead for a famine and had stored up supplies in Egypt for the people. So the brothers set out bound for Egypt. None of them aware that Joseph's story had bent him to Egypt years before and that he was in fact the wise governor now looking after a people in need. 
the brothers went before Joseph and pleaded with him for help and assistance. As soon as Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them, but they did not recognize the face of the brother they mistreated all those years ago in the Egyptian ruler who now stood before them. That's just one tiny little chapter of Joseph's story. But one thing that I truly love that this story finishes with is the verse that is found in Genesis 50, verses uh, uh, 20. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. We'll just have that flicked up on the screen again. It actually starts from verse 19 on the screen. It says, do not be afraid. This is Joseph talking to his brothers who were obviously freaking out that Joseph was going to have the ultimate revenge on them because of how they were mistreated, how they mistreated him early in, in the early days. But Joseph said, no, do not be afraid. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Because what happened is that within the storms of Joseph's life, God brought out the good but not only the good for Joseph and his family, but for the good of a nation. The nation was preserved from dying of famine. This is the nation of Israel. From dying of famine because of how the story of Joseph and all the storms that happened to him, not necessarily because of him, but to him, happened to him because of all those storms Good came out of it in the end. And how awesome is Joseph's perspective that he is able, while everything, all the storms were raging, while he was in the jail cell, while he was being falsely accused, while he was being sold into slavery, while all those storms were raging around him, he still had the perspective of staying true, anchoring firm into who God is and who God promised, and what God promised, I should say. Teen Street, Jesus is the ultimate authority. And Joseph's life is testimony to that. It's testimony that good can come from our storms. I'm not going to spend too much more time up here sharing with you because, as I said, these throne room times that we have at Teen Street is more about what God is wanting to still unload to you but also giving you the opportunity to respond to what God has already downloaded. I'm just going to invite the worship team to come up as we move into this time of just doing that. The song that we sang prior to me jumping up on stage, Cornerstone. The title, Cornerstone. Those of you who are in the construction or carpentry and things, I think people who make buildings, you will know that the cornerstone is a vital component of any building that has been made. It is the stone that forms the base of the corner. Get that right, get that solid, and the building will be good as it continues to get built. It is an important quality or a feature on which a particular thing depends on. In construction, it's what the building depends on. In our life, it's who we depend on. And we sang about it, Christ alone, cornerstone. He is the cornerstone of our lives. 
Storms come and storms will continue to come. Whether you are sailing in the calm seas or whether you are getting the waves tossed at you, Christ alone, cornerstone. That is the hope that we can anchor ourselves into in life. And when you think of the picture of an anchor, what the anchor does, it actually anchors itself into the bedrock that is below a boat. Generally, it's used in a boat. And that boat, if the storms come, it might get tossed about, it might move about, but it will not get lost. That's what anchors do. And if we anchor ourselves in the cornerstone of Christ, if we stand firm, like a building stands firm on the cornerstone, if we stand firm on the cornerstone of Christ, storms, yeah, they come, but we will not get lost. Jesus can calm the storm, but Jesus if the storm continues to rain, he can give us that shalom peace, which is beautiful. So as we move into a time of worship, I'm just going to read out some Bible verses, possibly ones that can anchor yourself in the bedrock. When the storms come, you can think of this Bible verse and you go, yep, I am standing strong on the cornerstone of Christ. And as I read them out, I I don't want you to do this flippantly or because the person next to you is doing it or because you think that's what I want to see. I want you to do what I'm about to invite you to do because you are, you've pondered the verse that I'm going to read out. You've reflected on everything that we've spoken about and shared with you and studied today. And you are saying, I'm going to stand on that cornerstone. I'm going to stand on that promise that the Word of God gives us when the storms rage. I have 10 to read out. And if in your heart you just feel as though whether you're on the calm seas or whether you're you're in the raging storm, and if in your heart you feel like, I just want to stand on that promise, that is what we are going to invite you to do as I read them out. But it's not, as I said, don't do it because you think that's what you have to do or the person next to you. Do it because you mean it. Do it because you are saying, this day at Teen Street, I am anchoring myself to the cornerstone of Christ. No matter what the storms come at my life, no matter what the storms I'm experiencing, I'm anchoring because I know Christ alone, cornerstone. So our first verse comes from James chapter 1, verse 12. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test of time, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. James chapter 1, verse 12. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 13 says, Be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous, be strong. 1 Corinthians 16, 13. Romans 12, 11 to 12. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Romans 12, 11 to 12. Second Chronicles 20, verse 17. You will not have to fight this battle. 
Take up your positions. Stand firm and see the deliverance the Lord will give you, Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Go out to face them tomorrow and the Lord will be with you. 2 Chronicles 20.17 Psalm 119 verse 28 My soul is weary with sorrow. Strengthen me according to your word. Psalm 119 verse 28 2 Thessalonians 2.16 to 17 May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope, encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. 2 Thessalonians 2, 16 to 17. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 10. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak then he is strong. 2 Corinthians 12, 10. Luke 21, verse 19. Stand firm and you will win life. Luke 21, verse 19. 2 Timothy 4, verse 7. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. 2 Timothy 4, verse 7. And our last one, Isaiah 41.10. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God, and I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous hand. Isaiah 41 verse 10. So Lord... We thank you. We thank you that we can stand firm on the promises that you give us in your word. We thank you that we can stand firm on who you are, Jesus, the ultimate authority. We thank you that you are our cornerstone. We thank you that we can anchor ourselves into that. And, Lord, we will not get lost if we do so. So, Lord, I just pray that in these moments, as our hearts and our minds and our eyes are turning from our circumstances, turning from our storms, Lord, as they turn from those and look to you, Lord, Just strengthen us in who you are. Strengthen us. Give us what we need as you promise you always do. You are the great provider. You you give us what we need in the moments that we need them. And Lord, if it is a peace that people are needing here tonight, that shalom peace that they are needing because the storm is raging. Father, I just pray that you just pour out your peace on those of us who are in those moments. Thank you that you are the Prince of Peace. Thank you that you calm our storm whether it's our life or the storm that's in our heart. Thank you, Jesus, for being our, the ultimate authority. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.